welcome Lauren, Emmy winning Lauren, soon to be author, though I think you're an author already. The book is coming out. Welcome to the podcast. Really excited for this. We are jamming out on ESPN before we start recording on this. I've worked there. You currently work there. It's a sign line reporter. You have the gig of so many, I would say men and women, like look at you and say, I want that job. How do I get that job? Um, How does it feel to be, first of all, in that position as a sideline reporter on, on, for college football? Well, you know, it's interesting, Ryan. Um, I actually was on the sidelines this past weekend and, um, you know, I'm not sure exactly when this is going to air, but this is week two of the college football season. And I'm standing like behind the bench, uh, you know, in this game and it's Liberty playing New Mexico state uh, in Las Cruces. And, I had like this moment and this happens a lot where I'm just standing there and it's like, wait, like I'm like doing this, like I'm doing this, like I'm here, I'm on the sidelines, I'm covering college football. I'm an author of a book like that's coming out soon. Like it's crazy because I think sometimes, you know, life, as we were talking about before we jumped on the podcast, life is like crazy, you know, and when you're a parent and you are trying to manage, you know, the house, you know, your husband, your child, um, I'm on the road, you know, three, four days out of the week. Then I have to like, take a step back and realize like, like I'm doing this thing, you know, mm. and I've worked so hard for it, um, over the years, like just getting to this point, right. Because it's not just a, Oh, like I'm graduating from college. Let me get online and see ESPN sideline reporter. Let me see if there's a job opening, right? Like, no, it is a climb, 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 climb to finally get there. And so, um, you know, sometimes I do have to like kind of reel myself back in and be like, Holy cow, like I'm doing this. And, you know, I've, I've put in a lot of work to get here and this was not easy. And this was, this was a grind and it's still not easy, but I'm here and and I'm trying to embrace and enjoy enjoy the ride. It's amazing. And someone that has worked at ESPN, I am familiar with the football schedule, actually all sports schedules, when the games are, how late they are, uh, how often they are. And I will say that is definitely a grind. It is, it, it's amazing. What you do is amazing. I'm sure it's fun. I'm sure it's very rewarding. It is, it is very difficult as well. I know this isn't for the people wondering, this isn't necessarily a topic of the episode. We're going to go much deeper than this, but it's, it's really fun to kind of chat about. I remember sitting in the studios in Bristol, Connecticut, you're on the road, obviously traveling to the games. I'm in Bristol and it's like midnight, 1am and Hawaii comes on. <laughs> like, I just want to go to bed so bad. And you, all the yeah. travel that's in, that's entailed, like all the details behind the scenes, you getting all the stories, all the sign line reporting. I don't think people really understand like, what a grind it is and how much work actually goes into that. So I see that Emmy right behind you. Congratulations on that. That is, that's one of the coolest things. How long have you been doing this for? Oh man, long time. Um, so I went to Rutgers. I was a gymnast at Rutgers, believe it or not. I'm very tall sitting behind this desk, five foot nine, way too tall to be a gymnast, but, um, love the sport of gymnastics, went to Rutgers, graduated in 06 and essentially kind of put the wheels in motion. So I actually started at CNBC in Inglewood Cliffs, right? And like financial news, like was not my thing, but it's understanding TV from the ground up, right? So it gave me this great understanding of how it all works together because people just think, oh, like you put this show on there. Like if you understand the intricate details that like make it happen and then you've got your control room, which is essentially like the, the, the heart, the heart system, the heartbeat of how it all goes. And then you've got all the, the vessels, right. And the attachments and everything, um, you know, it, it is, uh, it's, it's been an experience trying to understand and map that out. And I think that's kind of what, what's been cool is I started at CNBC and then I kind of went to a really small market. Um, I went back to my hometown station for a couple of years. Uh, and then I went to a very small station in Parkersburg, West Virginia, which in the demographics, right? So like New York City is one, right? The DMA, it's based on like population. And um, what does DMA stand for? Oh my gosh, I'm drawing a blank on this. You probably know. Um, but essentially it's kind of like these calculations, right? So then you LA, Boston, like you have all these cities. Well, this was market 193, Parkersburg, West Virginia. And there are only like 200 total. Like, so it was like, <laughs> woo, tiny little, tiny little thing. I may, it might be like 210, like 210 markets total. So Parkersburg, very small, but great place to get my experience, make my mistakes, forget my name on air, have no idea what I'm doing. And then ended up in Birmingham, Alabama in um, 2011. And I'll tell you, I think that is what's crazy is that I joke about this now, but it's kind of true. 
Like, I feel like I, I need to, um, to, to, to give Nick Saban some sort of like gift because I feel like because of the dynasty that he built at Alabama, right. Um, and, and Alabama and Auburn both have had great programs, but it brought this, you know, it, it really, it didn't put SEC on the map necessarily, but I mean, in essence, like you're, you're talking about this, this dynasty program, then suddenly SEC network comes to life, right. It's born. And without having the success of these programs and the success of the SEC and the SEC just continuing to like take over, you know, you, um, you wouldn't have, you know, you wouldn't have SEC network. You wouldn't have these opportunities. And because I was in Alabama during that time, it just put me in a position to be able to, uh, you know, essentially, um, you know, uh, be here and, and, and get to do this. And I'm still in Alabama now, but it's, uh, it's, it's really, really cool. Uh, you know, just kind of being here in the South rooted in college football. It's kind of my baby and, um, I'm having a good time. That's amazing. So it's like right place, right time, but always being ready, saying yes to opportunities, which I think is super important. I can ask you, I'm curious, do you watch yourself? Like after the games, do you critique yourself? Do you watch the video, see any kind of ticks or things you can do better? So watching yourself is very important in our industry. I was actually just talking to my friend Dawn Davenport about this yesterday. So she's also on the sidelines. Um, she's in Nashville too. She's uh, she's does does a radio show there in Nashville as well. Um, and she and I were both saying like it's almost cringy like to go back and watch yourself because you're like you know it, it's like just the way you sound and you, you just dig into everything. Oh, that sounded terrible, or I should have done it this way or whatever. But that's the only way you get better because the thing is, I think we all pick up on habits, right? Certain ways that we might like you know, introduce something or we crutch words. Yeah, guys. Yeah, guys. It's easy to get into this habit of like saying certain things a certain way over and over and over again. And then you realize it when you hear it, you're like, wow, I just said, I just said a certain word four times in that <laughs> 20 second clip and you don't realize it in the moment. So it's always like making sure that, um, you know, you get things buttoned up and, and I think that's the only way we progress. And so I love feedback. I think it's great when we get feedback from management, when they sit down and watch and pull clips and say, Hey, this was really good. I like how y'all executed this. Maybe you could do this a little better. Like that's the only way you get better. Right. And you're talking about, you know, week in and week out. I think one of the things I will say, Ryan, that, you know, I've had to learn is compartmentalizing because look like you, um, we have a four hour game essentially, uh, these games we've had these past couple of weeks have been so long. I'm ready for a short one. I'm ready for a three hour game. Um, run the football. Let's go. <laughs> uh, but um, it's interesting because I do feel like you have all this time now, of course I'm on the sidelines. So, you know, my role is still very significant, but you know, they're coming down to me and I have 30 seconds to get it out there. But what's so easy that happens sometimes is you have a mistake, you fumble on your words, you can't get it out. Right. It sounds terrible. You're, you know, blah, whatever you got to compartmentalize it because like, look, you've got a whole nother three and a half hours to go on this football game. And if you continue to let that one mistake get in your head. It's just the dominoes fall. Boom. And so it's, it's just, it's, it's having that ability to compartmentalize. And so off the, off the top of the show, you know, you want to come out strong, but it doesn't always happen that way. And there's always, you know, you can have literally what you want to say, like just rolling in your head over and over and over and feel really confident and out the gates. And all of a sudden, like, you know, there's a distraction, the band's playing, the noise is loud, the music's going, like all this stuff, the players are running by you, you just get bumped in the shoulder. Like there's so many like factors that go into this. And then, I mean, we're all human, right? I mean, there's been times where I'm just trying to get a word out and I've had to get to the point where I just learned to laugh about it. Like, ah, can't get that word out. Let me try this again. Boom, 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 you know? So um, it's definitely comes though with a lot of reps. And so I tell people that I said, man, you got to rep this bad boy out because it, uh, it is not for the faint at heart and it takes, it takes time to really like figure it out. And I'm still figuring it out work in progress always. And, uh, you know, I'm 39 years old, about to hit the fourth floor, getting close to, to punching that, punching that button on the elevator Come and take it me. on up. Come join me. I mean, <laughs> I know here we go, baby. Let's go. Here we go. Um, compartmentalizing. I have a feeling this might be brought up again later in this episode. Um, as I mentioned, future author. October 1st, your book Shatterproof is coming out, which is congratulations on that. That's that's just a feat in itself. I was going to say, I got my book right here. Whee! 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's pretty awesome. What stadium is that at? Um, actually this is here in Birmingham. So this was a photo. This is really funny. This is a funny story. So, um, is, I have the hardcover. This is one of the, the advanced, um, copies that we had gotten. So I have the hardcover coming out. Um, but what's funny about it is, okay. So I, am uh, I have a 14 month old. And so as we're in this process of like getting this book ready, uh, then comes the time of like, okay, what are we going to do for the cover? And, you know, we've obviously mapped out like the title and all the stuff and, what are we going to do for the cover of the book? And I'm like, well, you know, I guess probably need to get a photo shoot together and figure it out. Well, I'm like literally at this point, um, maybe a month postpartum. I mean, <laughs> I was actually, when we were talking about this in April, I was like, still, I was still pregnant. And I'm thinking like, I ain't going to do no photo shoot looking like a, you know, 50 pound beach whale over here. <laughs> You know, or, or 50 pounds heavier than, you know, I, I gained a lovely 55 pounds when I got pregnant. So it's just wow. funny because I was like doing everything I could. I was like, oh no, like, what are we going to do? Like, I, I, I'm i not going to feel like myself, blah, blah, blah. And so it's funny because actually we pulled that photo. We did a photo shoot back in, it was, I think it was 2019 um, at Mountain Brook High School. Um, and it was kind of when I was starting this journey into speaking. And sharing my story and like getting it out there and putting it out in the uh, in the world. So in some ways I was kind of like, oh man, like we have to use an old photo. But then I was like, you know what, this, like this photo right here was taken when I was starting to really make that transition, right? And so there actually is very, there's significance in that. And I think that's the cool part is like, you know, it, it not everything has to be bright, brand new, shiny, whatever. Like this, this is a part of who I am. And this was a moment in time where I started like becoming, finding my voice and like, actually, you know, I had found my voice. And at this point I was ready to like get up on the stage and just shout it out. That's awesome. That's yeah. cool. I'm, I'm always curious to know like the story behind the story and the photos, the videos behind the music, all that kind of stuff. It's really cool. just to kind of, kind of get a little yeah. backstage pass, if you will. And we're going to get a backstage pass of you and your crazy life here. And, uh, and it's why you wrote the book. Really excited, really happy that you're being vulnerable and just being really honest with your story. I mean, that's one of the reasons I started this podcast was, I don't know, kind of uh, to give myself and others a platform to be honest and vulnerable and, and to connect with people that are trying to find happiness, trying to find ways through their struggles or just trying to find something to grasp onto. Um, and it could be anything you say in this episode, you never know, it's going to change someone's life and mm. to have, to have it written in, in book form. Congratulations on that. I know that's, that's, that takes a lot of work. Hopefully that's something I, I get to do lot. at some point. Yeah. I literally look at, look at these pages and I'm like, first of all, like, how did I fill all these pages? Like, I just don't even know how I did it. You know, let's like, talk when, let's talk in the future about like what the hell the process was for, for doing that. I, no, I'm, I'm happy to do curious. it. And honestly, I'm happy to put that out there for people to hear because I get a lot of questions about it. And I think, you know, cause I do think that it has become even more common that people are writing books. And I mean, people have been telling me for years, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. And I will say that, um, you know, it was something I always was like, I don't know how to write a book. Like what, you know? And, and it's crazy because there are resources out there for people, especially those that are kind of stuck in the, like, I want to do it. I just don't know how. Yep. And so I would be thrilled to share my insights because I think that a lot of people just get, uh, stuck in the process and the mindset of like, I don't know how to go about it. So it's never going to happen. And I just come back on. We'll, we'll do an episode of how to write yeah. a book for real. We'll come back, come back, we'll on. Come we'll, back we'll, to we'll, it. Okay. Yeah, that's it. awesome. Awesome. Love it. Well, so this book is one of, I guess you can say probably really tough times, tough memories, resilience, grit, perspective, mindset. Um, people look at you and they're probably like, oh, you know, cute blonde report, reporter, sideline reporter has the life, blah, blah, blah. It is, it's really nice to get some insight into how everyone has their own struggles. Everyone's dealing with something. Um what was it about 20 years ago? Was it just over 20 years ago now? 21, was that... yeah. 21 years. Yep. 21 years, March, March, uh, March 24th of 2003 was the day. Okay. So let's go ahead and take everybody back there to exactly what happened. And it's just like one day, literally it was one day that rocked your, in your family's entire world. And I can't even like imagine I'm someone who's, I'm turning 42 in a few days and I have both my parents my wife has both of her parents. 
how fortunate I am to be able to say that. It's one of those things you take for granted. Like, oh yeah, my family's here. I'm going to call my mom. I'm going to call my dad. I'm going to text them. That's not something you've been able to do for a few decades now. Yeah. So please, if you would just kind of take it away and kind of go over your story and where Shatterproof actually starts. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I do appreciate this opportunity to share because I am speaking of books, open book. And this is something that has taken a long time for me to get here. So as I sit here and I want to say this to everybody as full disclosure, as I sit here and share this story in depth with you, it took me a very long time to do that. And I know we'll dig into that more. But as I share this, this is something that took years and years and years to fully lean into and to be able to share with people. And so, um, you know, we go back to that day, right? So let me set you up with, uh, you know, I grew up in Roanoke, Virginia. Um, and it was me, 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 my mom and my dad and my older brother, Alan, and, uh, he's two and a half years older than me. And we were a sports family, always on the go, just like, you know, my brother was a three sport athlete, football, baseball, basketball. Dad was a volunteer coach. Mom was always making sure we were, you know, to practice on time everywhere we needed to go. I enrolled in gymnastics at a very early age, became very dedicated to the sport, loved the sport. Um, definitely was a challenge, you know, gymnastics is hard on the body, uh, had a lot of challenges and things that I faced, but really, um, we were a very close family, you know, traveling almost every weekend, whether it was for my brother's sports or for my gymnastics. And my parents were very supportive and lifting us up in our successes, applauding us, helping us when we were down. And it was, um, you know, it was just a very tough situation, you know, to be in when, um, you know, things would, uh, you know, with, 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 with travel and, um, you know, get on the road and everything else. And I would get in tough situations with like injuries and things like that. And my parents would always just, you know, Hey, you know, like you've got this, if you're ready to quit the sport, we we're with you. If you want to keep going, we're with you. And it was always that strong support system. So my dreams then became, uh, wanted to earn a college scholarship. Right. So I was growing, I hit a growth spurt, I had injuries left and right. But I knew like maybe I could take all this time and money that was spent on my gymnastics career and like do something with it. So then it was like, all right, put your head down. I started applying for different colleges. Um, my mom and I just sat at the dining room table for hours on end, uh, addressing these envelopes, putting these VHS tapes in there and I always joke about the VHS tapes. Cause Oh, by the way, life is a lot different now. If, if you know what I mean, because it's definitely, um, uh, you know, the world we live in now with YouTube and Vimeo and everything else, it's just easy to, you know, send it on. Right. And so we're snail mailing it to all these colleges. And so when I got the call from Rutgers University saying, hey, we have a scholarship we want to offer you, you know, I went for an official visit, felt like it was a place I could call home. It was an amazing moment and opportunity because what I realized in that in that in that time, you know, it's like all that hard work. It was an investment and it was an investment, not just me, the, the blood, sweat and tears and the grinding every single day in the gym. It was also an investment for my parents. And so giving that back to them in some way, you know, felt like such a gift. But you mentioned, you know, taking things for granted. I think sometimes when we're in it, we don't see it the way it is. And so it's coming out on the other side where you really, truly find that perspective. And, um, you know, assign my letter of intent, went to Rutgers and I had this like, you know, just excitement and this joy of like, I'm about to go live out my dreams, college gymnast. I want to be a sports doctor. I'm going to go do these pre pre-med courses at Rutgers. It's a great finding or great academic institution. And, um, it was a proud moment for me and my family. So I'm off to Rutgers and fast forward to my second semester. Um, I was studying for exams this particular evening on March 23rd. And it's crazy because most kids go off to school and maybe, you know, talk to their parents, text them. Um, at this time, there was no texting. That was not a thing when I was at Rutgers at this at this point in time. Um, but we were always talking on the phone, picked up the phone every single day. We talked on the phone every single day. Not a day went by that I didn't talk to my parents on the phone. And same this particular evening, hadn't talked to my parents, picked up the phone, called them, knew they would be home. Um, it was late in the evening and talked to my uh, mom and dad, my mom first 
we were chatting about gymnastics, chatting about life. Um, she always wanted to know everything I was doing in gymnastics. Like she was like on top of it always. And so we were, we were, um, talking about this new skill combination I was working on. And then my father, uh, she handed the phone off to my father was falling asleep on the couch. And I remember he had just celebrated his, uh, 52nd birthday. And I had been, you know, sad, like this is the first time in 18 years, I'm 18 years old that I hadn't gotten to celebrate with my dad in person. And so, you know, I, um, was talking to him about like, I can't wait to come home, you know, this summer we'll celebrate, we'll hang out, all the things. And so he had just said, Lauren, I love you. I'm proud of you. Keep doing the, doing great work. Um, and that was it. We hung up the phone, said our goodbyes, said our I love yous. And uh, I remember um, talking to my roommate for a few more minutes, set my alarm clock, drifted off to sleep. And next thing you know, I wake up to the phone ringing and I sit up abruptly. And of course I look out the windows and it's still dark outside. I look at the clock, it's just after 3 a.m., and, uh, I look at the caller ID on the phone and I was like, it said home. And I'll go, Oh my gosh, like why are mom and dad calling me in the middle of the night? And so I answer with hesitation and my dad on the other end said, Lauren, I need to talk to your brother. And I said, well, what's wrong? And he said, Lauren, I just need to talk to your brother. I need his phone number. So I open up my you know phone and my contact book and I read out his number to him and he said, okay, I'll call you back. No more than 30 seconds goes by. Dad calls me back. And, um, I just remember as I'm sitting there, like, what's wrong, dad? And he just says, Lauren, your mom died. And I was like, what? Like, am I here? What? Like, I just talked to mom. She's 45 years old, seemingly healthy. It's the middle of the night. Like, what do you mean mom died? And he said, Lauren, I can't explain it now. I just need you to get on the next plane you can. I'll be at, be at the airport to pick you up. And as you can imagine, 18 year old had no, not even like maybe $50 in my bank account. That wasn't going to get me that $250 plane ticket. This was back before you could just log into the app and like book stuff. So I'm on the phone for over 30 minutes. We call them. I didn't have enough, uh, didn't have enough money. My, my roommate gives me her credit card, not enough money on the credit card. We had to get the limit increased. It was this whole mess. And then I'm frantically trying to get my stuff, get a ride to the airport. I mean, it's just chaos, absolute chaos. And finally, I get to the airport, I get up in the air, and I, I just remember like looking out in, into the the abyss of clouds, thinking like, this has got to be a nightmare. This has got to be mm -hmm. a nightmare. I just want to get home and talk to my dad. My dad's going to make everything okay. Like, just get home. Plane touches down. Had not talked to my dad because we lived about an hour from the airport. So we had built a house out in kind of rural Virginia. And had not talked to him, but just knew that he was going to be there. I walk outside and I see my uncle and my cousin pull up. And I was just like, well, this is weird. But then also was like, I'm sure my dad's probably still taking care of things at the hospital. Like, I'm going to see him. Like, we're going to get in the car. We're going to go drive home. Like, that's it. And then we start driving. And my uncle hadn't said anything. And everyone's just really upset. And you could just tell. And so I finally just like worked up the courage as we're like pulling out of the airport. I said, Uncle Mike, I said, I want to see my dad. Where's my dad? And as he's pulling off the exit, I can still like feel the gravel underneath the car, like the crunch of the tires as he puts it in park and he looks at my cousin and then he turns around and looks at me in the backseat of the car. And he says, Lauren, I'm sorry, but your dad's passed away too. And that was it. I was just like, and I just remember slumped over like in the middle of that seat, in the middle of that uh, car, um, in the back seat, and just thinking like, and at this point I had just felt like I cried myself out already. And I was like, it was this weird feeling because it was obviously shock to the system, mm -hmm. but it's like, you know, I find out my mom's dead. And then you just assume that you're, I'm, I'm going to have my dad there to like help pick up the pieces, help keep me together help keep me from just completely falling apart. And then I learned that he's gone too. And it's just, oh, like going back to that day, like reliving that day, like just, oh, just the most gut-wrenching, um, you know, feeling when all of a sudden your world just gets turned upside down. And and like you said, Ryan, like in a matter of, uh, you know, a matter of hours, right? My parents passed away within five hours of each other. And it was just, Ugh, shock to the system. I, I mean, it's just, 
I'm just like putting myself in your shoes, which is absolutely impossible, nor do I really want to. But it's like one young parent passing away is enough shock to the system. Probably, I'm just picturing you trying to get that plane ticket, probably shaking, um, trying to figure out, is this even real? Um, to getting home to finding your other parent? Like, it's just like, Do you want to explain like what happened to the listeners? Like it was an opioid it was an overdose. Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you know, it's interesting when I tell this story, uh, you know, I, I do a good bit of public speaking and keynote speaking um, around the country. And it's interesting because when I would share this story, you know, I would obviously tell the story and then the next thing I would say is how it happened. Right. Cause everybody wants to know how it happened. And um you know, what's crazy about it is I didn't even know what happened for years. And people are kind wow. of like in their head. Like, what do you mean you didn't know what happened? Like, how do you not know? Let me put it this way. Our bodies and our brains have these defense mechanisms that can do a darn good job of protecting us if we allow it to. And that's exactly what I did. I did everything I could, Ryan, to literally ignore and run from reality because I was so afraid to know and understand the truth of what happened, right? So my parents have been going to a pain management doctor in Roanoke. This pain management doctor um, that they were seeing, my mom had degenerative disc disease. So it was just kind of this like, you know, slow roll of just one issue after another. So she had had these tech two neck fusions and then she was dealing with carpal tunnel and, you know, these foot issues. I mean, just everything. Right. So she was just in constant pain. My dad had chronic back pain, had a permanent tens unit at his back. Um, also struggled with PTSD from his service in the military. And, you know, they were going to this pain management doctor. They were being prescribed Oxycontin and that's where it started, right? So they were taking Oxycontin and we're talking like a 90 day supply at a time. Both of them are being given because, you know, my dad worked for the government. He worked for the VA medical center, you know, oh, we will mail in the prescription. Well, you know, it's cheaper if you, if you mail it in and you get a full 90 day supply. Well, knowing what we know now about opioids and especially Oxycontin, a 90 day supply of that, I mean- you're basically giving a child candy, right? Like a bag of M&Ms and say, hey, you know, ration these out for the next 90 days. Are you kidding me? Like that's the that's the crazy part when you talk about addiction and when you talk about reliance on substance. And so, um, you know, my parents were managing it for a while. It was helping with the pain, but then that wasn't working. So then they started on these fentanyl suckers that are for breakthrough pain. Right. And so that was supposed to kind of help when, you know, the, the, the time release of the oxys had kind of worn off. Well, this kind of helps the in between until it's time for your next, your, your next medication, your next pill. And this was the cycle right now, mind you, I'm, you know, when this starts 15, 16 years old in high school and, um, I guess back in 99 is when my mom had her first surgery. And so that was really kind of, I think when the dominoes fell, but, um, I'm oblivious to all this. I would be too. I mean, this isn't abnormal, right? I mean, this is like a normal mom and dad. Hey, my back hurts. Uh, you know, like I believe like what well, millions of families are probably prescribed these pills. Uh, it, pharmaceuticals is a tricky subject. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I'm I literally be too. sitting there just like, so of course they're going to pay management doctors. We're, me and my brother obviously living in the house at the time. My brother was, like I said, two and a half years older. He ended up going into the Navy. So he moved away to Norfolk, Virginia, where he was stationed, but he was coming back every weekend. And, you know, I've talked to him about this time and time again, and we're just like, we knew they were in pain but we felt like they were managing it. Right. And it's like, the doctor said, so we wrote a prescription. The doctor said, so, so when you see a thousand pill bottles laying around the house with their name on it, you're like, well, it's not illegal, right? Like they're doing what they're told. And it's just, it's, you know, as I sit here and dig into this and when you start to like, really think about like, how did you not know? How did you not know? You know, there, there is sometimes that like guilt that, you know, especially as I was trying to figure all this out, probably that set in, but I'll tell you this. Um, I think for me and why I, you know, I told you that when I go out and do these keynotes and it took me so many years to actually like 
get to the place where I would share their story because I didn't really understand and know their story because I refused to, to understand it is because of the, the, the stigma, right? The shame of it all. And it's like, I knew that mom had been taking medications and I knew that there, you know, was some issues. I didn't realize it was abuse though. I didn't realize she was misusing the medication. Do you and think I, she realized she was misusing it or did she just see, was to, like take as needed? That's the part that's hard for me. Cause when I go back to it, um, I do think there was a point in time where a, a switch flipped and she realized that like, I can't manage this anymore. Cause there was a point in time where she like got, so after the Oxycontin, um, wasn't, she wasn't able to manage the Oxycontin anymore. So I think there must've been a realization that like, this is not working. Like, I feel like I need to take too much. I'm not able to, to manage it. So I, I think she obviously had to have gone back to her doctor and said, Hey, what can we do to fix this? So then they put her on a fentanyl patch, which is the time release that she would wear like on her chest every 72 hours. Well, then eventually that wasn't working every 72 hours. So then they dropped it to every 48 hours. So like, if you're, you know, if you're her and you're saying, I can't manage this, what do I do? Then there has to be some, you know, conscious thought that like, uh, maybe this is a problem. Let's try to fix it. You know? And I remember she had gotten a lockbox at one point and taken some of the fentanyl patches and taken it to my aunt's house. And she had done that too, because my dad was starting to take her medication. Right. So this is where this like vicious cycle starts happening. Right. He still prescribed the oxy. She's got the fentanyl. This is, you know, this is not working anymore. We're going to try this. And it's just this vicious cycle. Here's the thing though. Like, you know, as a, as a 15 year old, 16 year old, 17 year old living in that household, I'm not sitting here, you know, walking in with a, a, a pen and paper and notebook and saying, okay, mom, what did you take today? How are you feeling? Like, oh, dad, what did you take today? Like, that's not my job. Mm -hmm. And they weren't letting me and my brother into their world. Right. Well, so, even if they did, would you even really know? I wouldn't know what the hell I'm like, oh, you're going to the doctor. That's great. He's got to yeah, be telling yeah, you everything. You, yeah, yeah, right. And and when when you see that this medication is helping them to get out of bed in the morning, that when the medication runs out, that it just completely like diminishes their quality of life. You're like, well, this is working. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. This is the, you know, thank goodness. But you just don't comprehend. And now as you've seen so many documentaries pop up and so many series, you know, dope sick and, um, you know, painkillers and this and that you, you now see how the, the, the wool was pulled over the eyes and you see that this stuff is highly addictive. And, you know, these doctors are shelling it out because, Hey, it's the, it's the new miracle drug, right? Here's the problem with all of this. Right. And, and, and I'm speaking to people that, um, you know, maybe have dealt with addiction, people that have dealt with addiction like I have on the other end of it, or people that are experiencing pain. That is the problem here. And that's the hard part of all this. Because look, Ryan, like I can't put myself in my parents' shoes. I don't know the significance of their pain. I mean, I, I'll tell you, I had a lot of pain in gymnastics, right? But it was like taking a leave, taking a leave. A leave was like the thing, right? For me. Um, I can't, possibly begin to comprehend the amount of pain that they were in, but then also not only the chronic pain, eventually it becomes the dope sick pain, the addiction pain, right? Now I've got to like, I've got to take this because if not, then I'm just, my body's just going to crumble. And I think that's the hard part because as much as I want to advocate and say like these prescription drugs, they're just dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. They are dangerous, but also when someone is fighting to like survive, fighting to you know, get up in the morning and have some sort of normalcy in their life. How can I, how can I be the one to sit on the other side of this and say, mom and dad, well, you shouldn't take that. You should just suck it up and do it. You know? So I think that's where like, there's this hard, like just understanding. And I think now, of course, hindsight, we're talking 21 years later. Um, I'm a little more mature now have asked a lot more questions. And I think ultimately see their story for what it is. But Ryan, I'll tell you this, it took me, get this, 10 years, 10 years to open up and read the toxicology reports. It was one of those things where I refused to look at them on paper because to me on paper, that is fact. And that factual information then means it's true, which then means I can't tell my little lie, my sugar-coated lie to everyone that my mom died of respiratory failure, which wasn't really a lie, 
but it wasn't really actually the root and like the cause of death, right? Mm -hmm. It was the medical term, right? Because essentially when you overdose, you have respiratory failure, you go into respiratory failure. So that terminology though, I latched onto because, oh, by the way, it sounded so much better than overdose, right? So I said that and then, well, what about your dad? And he died of respiratory failure, but it kind of just sounds like, well, if he dies, that sounds a little strange. They kind of died from the same thing within five hours. But I said heart attack because it's like, well, I could justify his heart stopped because he was, you know, he too ingested a lethal amount of fentanyl. But by saying respiratory failure and heart attack, it was so much more believable to people, right? Oh, respiratory failure. Oh, wow. That just, that sounds so terrible. Like her body just shut down. Because in my mind, I justified it as yes, she was taking a lot of medications and her body couldn't, her body couldn't uh, withstand the medications. Right. I was never acknowledging the fact that she literally took her and my dad both, took the fentanyl patch, stuck it in the freezer, ultimately pulled it out of the freezer because it turns into more of a gel crystal like form inside the patch, put it open, sucked on it and overdosed. Like, because that's a choice, right? Like that was a choice that they made. It wasn't like, oh, there was leakage in the patch and it killed her or, you know, whatever. Like it was an actual choice for her to ingest that fentanyl, knowing possibly what the consequence could be, which was, you know, ultimately losing your life, taking your life. And my dad, the same thing. But that to me is where you get so deep into this addiction thing. <sighs> you know, like you just think like, ah, there's like, why, why would somebody do that? But knowing what I know now and having done a lot of work um, here locally, uh, the, the Addiction Prevention Coalition is a organization that I've done a lot of work with and volunteered to bet on their board. I'd say they really helped me to navigate some of these things and really kind of help, first of all, educate, educate me, but then like getting into some mentoring programs. I've mentored over at the foundry and different recovery rehab facilities, talking to people that are living it brings a whole new perspective, right? Because now all of a sudden it's the understanding of how painful addiction is because you think, well, just stop, like, just stop taking it. Mm -hmm. Like, don't go get another prescription, but it's not like that. It's not that easy. Same with alcohol, same with drugs, same with a lot of addictions, right? It doesn't even have to be a, a, a pill or a substance form, right? Addiction comes in so many different forms, right? You know, we have food addictions. Like I probably, I'm on the spectrum for that probably, you know, I love, I love food, right? Um, I'm a foodie at heart. You know, there's gambling addictions. There's, you know, sex addictions, pornography. I mean, there's everything across the board, right? And I will say, you know, um, I think a lot of times society tells us what something is. So there's this stigma around it. So all I know is that addiction's bad. It's a character flaw. Oh, you know, my parents couldn't be addicts possibly. Like they are great people and they're loved by so many people. There's no way they could be addicts, right? Now you dig in deeper and I start to realize like, wow. And like the fight and the struggle that they put up every single day. And I, and I do think that to answer your question that you said before, to go back to that, did they know? I think that there had to have been some awareness piece at this point um, in this juncture. But I think at that point it was too late, right? And then you're trying to do everything you can to conceal it. Um, everything you can do to mask it. And I think that is, uh, you know, just the sad tragedy of it all because my parents were so ashamed Um asking to borrow money. We need help financially. Things were just a total disaster. Um, but never once said like, Hey, like I'm struggling with this. Like we need to do something. Mm. Now, as far as you know, like doesn't sound like your parents were suicidal, right? They were taking these pain medications to actually help live life, not mm -hmm. end life, which mm -hmm. You know, the irony there is ridiculous. I, I'm I'm curious as far as your, your dad goes, was you may not know this, was the loss of your mom kind of like it for him, like I can't live without your mother type of thing? Or did that just happen to be random as well? Do you do you know that answer? Well, it's interesting you would ask that because um for years I did not know the answer. 
Um, because here's the thing. So like, there are so many black holes, right? Like you're like, when you go back and try to piece together, especially in traumatic situations and, and circumstances like this, and, and this has been a lot of work through my therapist, y'all like figuring all this out. Right. Cause now I'm at a place in my life where I've experienced a lot of healing. I want to understand the why, you know, and maybe it's something I can unlock to help someone figure out maybe something they're going through. Mm -hmm. But like when we are experiencing tra traumas like this, right. Like, you know, you have a 24 hour day and you think of like a film strip, right? Like there's going to be like these black holes all the way through it of understanding like what happened. Well, look, I wasn't in the house when this happened. I, my dad, my, my, my mom and dad were the only two there. My brother was obviously back in Norfolk at the time. So there were a lot of things I didn't know. And all we had to go off of, and we'll start with my mom's death is when my dad called after he had found her slumped over in the chair outside um, he had fallen asleep on the couch. And so he had, uh, always fell asleep on the couch, like, like watching TV. He got up to go to the bedroom and went to, um, find her and she wasn't there. Like she wasn't in the bed. He looked all over the house. She was slumped over outside where she had ultimately taken the fentanyl. And we don't really know where she took it and what happened in that, in that sense. But um, with respiratory failure, you know, I think like she, I don't know if she went outside to like try to catch her breath. Like I, we don't really know that piece of it. All we know is dad woke up, found her, tried to pull her into the house, tried to bring her back, shock her back to life. Right. There's this whole like urban myth that like you put them in a bathtub, like you can kind of shock them back. And I think that's where my dad was kind of desperately trying to like bring her back without letting the secret, the cat out of the bag, so to speak. Cause I think he, at this point knew what had happened. I think he had a pretty good idea of what had happened because he had actually overdosed at Thanksgiving and survived by also ingesting fentanyl Did because you know, he read were online. Were you aware of that when that happened? Were you aware that happened? I was aware that uh, he had a bad reaction to medication because hmm. that's what we were told. Hmm. That was it, right? So in my mind, oh, he's on blood pressure medicine and cholesterol medicine. He must have started some new, new medication and it, you know, just bad reaction. So... I knew, I knew, um, I knew about, they were taking all these medications, but no, I had no idea it was an overdose. So I went back to Rutgers. I was home for Thanksgiving. All I went back to Rutgers being so thankful. My dad's still alive. That's all I cared about. My dad's still alive. I didn't ask a lot of questions. My dad's still alive. That's all I care about. Right. So I wasn't really asking all the questions of what, what happened, what led to this. And, and my parents were, oh, bad reaction to medication. What we didn't realize is that he went online, read that you could put the fentanyl in the freezer, suck on the patch. It's it's what he did. He even told my mom in front of my grandparents, it did exactly what it was supposed to do. And um, that was it. So like, I was very unaware of that situation, right? Now looking back, I, the pieces have all come together. But, you know, my dad um, calls and, um, you know, we, we have the communications for essentially what his account of what happened to my mom was. Um, and both of my parents, I will say this on the toxicology reports were ruled accidental overdoses. Right. And a lot of that is with an investigation that happens. And I think some things, cause you ask the question specifically, do you think it was intentional? And in my heart of hearts, no, I never have thought it was intentional for either one of them, knowing my parents, but even in the dark depths of the, the, the pain that they were in and the financial distress they were in, the house was about to go into foreclosure. The cars were being repossessed. One of them had already been repossessed. They were coming after the other one. Like it was just this, it was a terrible, terrible situation. But as much as is as, as, as hard as that struggle must have been for my parents. I truly don't believe that they intentionally took their lives. I do think that the medication and the addiction that they were experiencing was very strong and had the ability to take their lives as it did. But the reason I say that is, you know, through the investigation, there were some things that pointed to the fact that um, my mom had painted her nails that night. They had packed a cooler. They were going to go stay with my grandparents. Um, you know, there was no indication that it was like a premeditated thing. And then I will add this with my father, because I think there are more questions that raise from the fact that like just five hours later, he overdosed the same thing. Like, was he trying to, you know, just ease the pain? Did he want to 
leave and go be with my mom? Um, I think that, you know, is a, is a fair question. And it's a question that I've asked myself for years and years and years, but I can tell you this, and it's, it's outlined in the book and it's such a big part of the story that really didn't come to fruition until the last couple of years. And, and it's just incredible. So I ended up meeting the deputy that actually responded to the call that morning when my dad, the call that my dad had collapsed came in. He had already passed at this point. So they walk into the house and he's, um, he's already passed. And, uh, it's crazy because, you know, in my mind, I'm like, you know, at this point, like mom had already passed, like this whole thing's happening. And he told me, he said, Lauren, like as a young, you know, officer, as a young deputy trying to navigate this world, like we all walked in the house and just assumed it was suicide. But he, since talking to him, you know, we've, we've dug in quite a bit on some of these things. His name's Eric Twaits and I'm close with his family now. I've really developed a strong bond with him and his family. Um, it's crazy because he told me, he said, while we all thought it was suicide, then he's like, knowing what I know now, having worked around drugs, he was on the drug task force for many years in Giles County, where I'm from. So knowing what I know now, he's like, your, your dad didn't, didn't intend to take his life. He said, number one, the addiction was obviously had a hold of him. Number two, your dad died with the phone in his hands, doing everything he could to get your, you and your brother home. He said that to me is not indicative of a man that wanted to just end it. Right. He was trying to do everything he could. If, 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 if he had wanted to end it, he probably would have gone to the bedroom or to the couch and said, all right, I'm done. And he was doing everything he could to get us home and to get us mm -hmm. To him and mm. uh oof it's hard yeah. um I, I i i mean you don't have to go any deeper than that it, you tell the story over and over and over again in your in your other podcast in your book and in, in your speeches and stuff like that i my god it's like you're ripping off a scab all the time that's yeah. absolutely insane it's not just a scab it's like the worst scab you can possibly have that's just never going to heal um, I've done a couple episodes on the grieving process. Um, it's one of those things you just kind of hope to avoid in life and it'll, you'll never go through life unscathed. Everyone's going to have to grieve about something probably numerous times, sometimes worse than others. I can't help but listen to this thinking like, you must be angry. Like when does anger kick in for you? Because it's like, it's almost like they were just good people trying to make themselves feel better to live their lives, to get up, to go to work, go to bed and do it over again, take care of their kids. And I feel like they were like set up to fail along with many other people in the world. And like, how can you not just be angry? And I, I'm asking you that because it's like, how do you get over the anger too? Because I would be freaking pissed. If I were you, yeah. like I lost yeah. my parents. As you can I, see, the tears I, welling up in my eyes right now because it's such a valid question. Um, I think the, kind of the way you you versed it there is uh, pretty powerful, you know, like they were set up to fail. And, um, you know, that's that's hard because you think like, yeah, doing everything right, you know, um, uh, they were not perfect. Let's Let's be honest, right? Nobody's perfect. And, I, and I'll say this, you know, my dad struggled with alcoholism um, growing up and, and I, I kind of knew it, but I, di I, I didn't understand what it was. I just knew like, oh, you know, go back to your AA meetings. I would hear him and mom arguing about, you know, you, you're you off the wagon again. You need to go back to your meetings. Right. So I think, you know, the addictive piece was already that there. Um, I didn't ever meet his dad. His dad had passed my grandfather before, but I, I think that he might have had issues with alcoholism. So there's a generational piece to all this too. But I will say this, like, the anger piece that you talk about, there is anger, right? Because it's just like, you know, and it's like who to be angry at, right? Do Am I angry at them? Am I angry at God? You know, as a woman of faith, like who am I supposed to be angry at? And it's just this feeling, am I angry at the doctor? Like who, who can let this happen? Um, and it's so easy to go down that rabbit hole of like finding, finding that person or that thing to be angry at. And I think that there was absolutely anger, um, and even just 
anger within myself, right? Like, and, and, and granted, you know, at this time in my life, I had not even like thought about being a sports reporter. Okay. You know, so like, remember I wanted to be a sports doctor, but I ask questions for a living. I'm a professional storyteller and a professional question asker. Mm. And sometimes I do beat myself up and say like, why the crap? Why the heck did I not ask more questions? Why? And, you know, I'm darn good at it now. And sometimes my husband's like, Lauren, come on, enough with the questions. <laughs> but I will say, like, why didn't I ask more questions? Why didn't I dig deeper? And it's just crazy because I think, you know, looking back, my parents did a darn good job of hiding it, you know? Like, I remember this specific incident and I, I outline it in the book because I do think it's kind of like the precursor to like the day, March 24th. Um, my mom had called me up and said, you're coming home from Rutgers. You can't go back next semester. And I'm like, what? The finances aren't there. We're going to have to sell the house. Everything's in disarray. And like, I was just so confused and she was so angry. And my mom was always the like, pick me up. Like, you know, everything's great. She was so angry. And I'm like, what is wrong? And I just remember being so devastated because then I'm like, felt like it was my fault. Something's wrong. What did I do? Did I do something wrong? And then I called my dad later that day after he got off work. This was back when like he had pagers or whatever. And um, I'd page my dad and he finally called me back and he's like, yeah, he's like, you know, your mom's medication ran out, but don't worry. It's getting taken care of. We're getting a refill and she'll be fine. And the next day, like everything was fine. But back then I didn't understand what that meant. Like your medication ran out, like, okay, big deal. Like, you know, get back on track tomorrow. Yeah. But it's it vitamins. is. Vitamins. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a big deal when you're in the pain that she's in. And now the obviously dope sick piece of it. I mean, just, you know, I can't imagine. And so, you know, I think that that anger piece for me is like, you know, I ask questions here and there, but like my parents always just, oh, everything's fine. She got her medication. Everything's fine. And so talk about being darn good at compartmentalizing things. We talked about that earlier on the sidelines. Well, I've gotten really good at it. Because it's been my life, my whole life, Ryan, compartmentalize, 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 right? Because, oh, well, dad relapsed, compartmentalize. Oh, I forgot about that. Moving on to the next thing. He's at my gymnastics meet. He's supporting me. He's loving me. We're in church. We're singing our praises to the good Lord above. Everything's fine. Oh, relapse again six months later. Oh, box it up, put it on a shelf, right? So I've gotten so good at that. What are your th real quick? What are your thoughts on compartmentalizing? Because I, being a sports guy, I watch as much sports as you do probably, and you see like so and so's brother die in a car accident, and here he is playing the game. He's able to compartmentalize and put on the performance of his life, and it's almost like glorified to be able to do that. Are you like proud that you can do that, or is that a negative that people can compartmentalize and just put things on the shelf? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I've never been asked that. Like if I'm proud of it, um, I'll say it's been a, it's, it's probably been a gift at times, but I think like anything else, it can also be a setback and it can be a ham hamstring, um, you know, in, in some ways, because then you get so good at it that like, think about it, right. You put it on the shelf. Well, eventually that shelf's going to get full, right you do the same thing you stuff stuff down and eventually like it's going to fill up to here and then it's just going to be a massive explosion and I will say I think that's where the work that I've done I think that there's a balance compartmentalizing can be great but there has to be a moment where you just fling those doors open and say okay here it is right like let's work on this and I think that it you know of course like I said keep in mind this happened 21 years ago I'm I'm still processing all this and I will say the book has been an unbelievable resource, one that I hope will touch people's lives, meet them where they're at, wherever they're dealing with shame and, 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 and grief and trauma. But I will say that, you know, there's been a level of healing. And I think a lot of that has come with the work that I've done. And it's taken years and years and years. So when I sit down, you know, uh, in therapy sessions and try to move through this stuff, there's still so many issues that I have to go back to. And it's like, well, I do this because of something I dealt with back here, the abandonment issues, the, the, the you know, the, the, there's, there's, they're all connected in some way, shape or form. Right. And mm -hmm. so now it's like, how do you work through those and how do you heal some of those strands that everything is connected to? Right. 
But for me, having a deeper understanding has been such a healing process. And that deeper understanding came with writing this book. You know, I worked with a guy, his name's Holland Webb, um, phenomenal writer and just someone that dug under the surface. And he said, all right, I want to, I want to really get into this. And so like having someone that could really pull it out of me, because I do think in some ways, and now, you know, this is probably the first time I've thought of this and said this, like, first of all, I'm not a novelist, like I'm not a writer, I'm a conversationalist. So I'm a lot better at conversating versus like, you know, creating 200 and some pages worth of, you know, written text. But, um, you know, I hadn't thought about this before, but I think having someone there to help me craft this, because I do think in some ways, like compartmentalize, it, it forced me, it forced me to pull those boxes off the shelf mm -hmm. and open them up and say, here they are. Because I do think there are some that I just kind of left, left there for a little bit and just said, no, nah, I'm not going to touch that. It almost seems like your parents were great at compartmentalizing because you didn't really know what was going on with them, which leads me to believe as you're also leads me to believe, it leads me to want to know you as a parent to me as a brand new parent, what is the balance of compartmentalizing to our kids? Because it's like, I wonder this a lot. I'm not in a great mood every day. Work stresses me out. There's things going on. I'm sick. I'm whatever. How much do I show my kids um, compared to how much do I put on a brave face um, compared to how much do I want to tell them and be honest and vulnerable with things? It's what a tricky line to walk. Is this something you think about often is how you want to communicate with your kids and how much emotion you want to show them or the struggles that you're going through? I mean, it definitely brings a lot of perspective. And I'll tell you, it was just a several, a uh, few months ago that I was actually at my parents' grave site and I had taken Mason there and I, you know, they're buried um, a few hours from my hometown. And so I don't get there as often as I would like. But I remember taking Mason, my son, and um, sitting there and kind of just being in that moment. And not that he'll, he'll remember, you know, he's too young to remember. He's 14 months now. He was, you know, 12 then. Um, you know, I think as I was sitting there kind of just thinking about it and realizing like, you know, I, I think there's a, there's, there's a means to protect the ones we love and a means to protect those around us. And I think that's what my parents were ultimately trying to do. But I also think there is a balance, like you said, of how do you communicate with your children? How do you communicate with the ones you love? So they, they have insights and that they can be a lifeline for you, even when you're not willing to let them in when, when, when it, it becomes a critical situation and people are just completely blindsided by it. Right. And I think about it too. Like, you know, I want my son to know my parents. I want, I want, I want him to know the amazing, wonderful, loving parents they were to me and the, the gifts that they gave me along the way and continue to give me that now I get to to gift and, and be that parent to Mason, but also want him to know the truth. I want him to understand and know the truth when he's old enough to understand it and to, to begin working on that process, because I do think it's important for him to know and understand. And, and you bring up a great point because that's probably going to be another topic I'm going to talk to my therapist about. Like, how do we introduce these things to our children, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Because I do want him to know and understand, because I think it's going to be so important and critical for him. Number one, we talk about that generational addictive piece, right? Like my hope and prayer is that I personally, because I've never drank, I've never done drugs. Like I've never just no desire. I'm around it. Like whatever. I'm not, you know, somebody wants to drink a beer, fine, whatever. Like none of that stuff bothers me. I just personally could care less about participating. I'm just like, eh, mm, you know, whatever. Um, it's probably saved me a lot of money and headaches along the way, but I would say this, I am so grateful because I feel like in many ways and I, and I hope and pray that like those chains of addiction and that, you know, that generational curse, right. Has just been eradicated because of my decisions not to go down that pathway, you know, and let me tell you, like I went back to Rutgers two weeks after burying both my parents and I was in and out of every party and frat house and everything you can think. And I saw a lot of things that I had never seen in my life, you know, walking into a room, lines of Coke on the table, this and that, like, whoa, there were plenty of opportunities for me to go down that pathway. Let me try something to numb this pain, to numb this feeling that I'm feeling right now, right? Um, 
I'm so grateful I didn't. And I now want to use that decision and just my now knowledge and understanding of what addiction is and how it can impact and ultimately the tragedies that can can result. I want Mason to understand that to its fullest, because I do think that there is a risk associated for him as someone that is my blood, right? Um, I want to ensure that he makes the right decisions and has the tools to go a different direction when things do hit him in the face. And when things do get, you know, when he got, when he gets, when he gets off balance and that he knows he's got somewhere to go and someone to turn to, and that it doesn't have to be a substance to, to help cope with the situations he's in. Um, I think those conversations are important. And I think there's different levels of how you can have those based on their age and their understanding mm-hmm. um, and all things, you know, I'm not quite at that point now, you know, we're still trying to say mama and dada, but <laughs> there comes a point where it's like, all right, you know, like this conversation has to be had. And um, I don't always love conflict. I don't always love tough conversations, but I think that it's important that we really lean into that. And I think now is m- more critical than ever, you know? Um, so I'll be interested in kind of navigating that. And you as a new father as well would be anxious to see kind of how, how you navigate that, because I think it's important. I think it's very important. And, you know, I think we, we learn from people and those have done it before us, but then we also have to find our own way and figure out what works well for our families and our, you know, individuals and our children. And so I think it's going to be a big learning experience and, uh, buckle up baby. Yeah. I, um, being a dad, I jumped the gun a lot because I'm thinking about like how to handle certain certain situations, how to have certain conversations, stuff like that. My son is five months old. Um, what is it? Your I'm sorry, your son or your son, right? Mason. Mason, Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's 14 months. So we're, we're way ahead of the game here, but something that I think about is how, when we're brought into this world, we're almost taught to believe our parents are superheroes. Um, which I go back and forth on. And there's just like something like, that's cool because like, I know I'm a good person. I know who I am at heart. And I really want my son to follow someone or emulate somebody with good values and good intention and stuff like that. But at the same time, I don't want to really want to be anybody's superhero. I'm just a human who's trying to learn and navigate through life. And I also really want him to know that as well. And, and, were your parents your superheroes growing up? And like, if so, I can only imagine how much more this whole situation just had to hurt even more because like I said, we're, we're, we don't really realize our parents are human until some point later in life, that they deal with the same problems that we'll get to at some point in life. They got stress, they got work, they got to pay the bills, all that stuff. I didn't really understand what the hell that was. And when you're, when you're a teenager, you're worried about homework. And finishing your assignment and perhaps like mowing the lawn to get your 10 bucks in allowance or whatever. Like that's what you're <laughs> yeah. worried about. It yeah. really is. And so like, I don't know, there's just something that I, I, I waffle back and forth and I don't need to worry about it now, but like being viewed as like a superhero, um, to my kid is like the double edged sword that comes with that. I'm just curious to know, to get your thoughts on that. So good. Yeah. I mean, I for sure put my parents on a pedestal, right? Like they could do no wrong. They could be no wrong. They were just, oh, like, you know, you're almost in awe, right? Like I'm in awe of my parents and in awe of just their love and their support. And don't get me wrong. Like I was a brat over there yelling at my mom and getting into arguments about really dumb stuff sometimes. But, you know, I will tell you this, like I talk about the phone calls. I literally, like if I got into an argument with her before I would head off to school, I would literally sit in the parking lot on my cell phone and resolve whatever issue it was and be late getting into school. Cause I could not stand starting my day off knowing like mom's mad at me mm-hmm. or we're having a conflict. Right. And so it would be, it would be an apology and an I love you before I'd walk into that school. And then half the time she'd have to write me a late note, you know, like an excuse for why I was late. <laughs> but, that's um, a cool memory. That's pretty awesome to get, you know, yeah. it's like, uh, that's the friendship with your mom. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Because you, you do like, and it, it's just funny because then, you know, it was, it, it, I realized at the time and now look back, I'm like such a brat. I'm like, wow, I was such a brat. But, um, 
you know, I think that every teenager goes through that and they say mm-hmm. girls are worse than boys. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, but I did look at them as superheroes. Like I absolutely just thought that everything they did. And while I knew they weren't perfect, I felt like they had it all figured out and that it's almost like, you know, that invincibility factor, you know, you feel invincible. I almost felt like as long as my parents were present, as long as my parents were there, as long as my parents were sitting next to me, holding my hand through life, we were invincible. Nobody could touch us. Nothing could touch us. Right. Um, And it's almost just like, even with the financial stresses, which I, again, was not even like super aware of. I mean, my mom was writing like $10 checks to the power company to keep the lights on, you know, but we're living in a, you know, a nice, you know, 2000 square foot house, bricks, brick style home that my parents had built. It was their dream home. I mean, it was nothing lavish, but to me it was like, whoa, because I had lived in a trailer before that we transitioned because we had to sell our house uh, while we were building the house. So we had to move in to a temporary living situation and we're living in this tiny little trailer. And I just remember being such a brat about that and what I would give to be back in that trailer, like eating, you know, TV dinners on card tables, watching football with my parents. Right. Mm. But um, it's wild because you do get that perspective. And I, and I just realized now, like my parents were so good at like just being the heroes Right. It's not so much that you think they're the heroes, like they were good at being the heroes. And I'm with you. I think that's a good conversation. Like uh, that's something to really dig into. And again, I'm going to add this to my list for my therapist (laughs) as a parent. Like, where do you draw the line between being that superhero and that admirable stoic figure in your your child's life to the person that can break down and say, look, like. Mommy's had a hard day. Mommy's had a hard day. I just need a moment. Mommy needs a hug from you. I've had a mm-hmm. hard day. Mm-hmm. I don't want to hide the tears from my son. You know, I'm a crier and I'm an ugly crier. Well, you know, I'll tell you that right <laughs> now. So I probably won't be able to hide the tears, but I don't, I don't want to hide the tears, you know? And um, I think that he needs to see emotion. And I think it's important for the emotion to be acknowledged. And you know, I think he needs to understand that it's okay. Right. And even as a man, a young man, I think we're, we're kind of told like men aren't supposed to cry. I used to watch my dad cry. You know, he'd Mm -hmm. have these flashbacks when he was in the military and I remember watching him cry and it would, it hurt a lot just to see him cry. Cause I just, and you know, again, he's the hero. He's the, he's the strong soldier. Right. Hearing him, seeing him cry was always really hard for me. Um, more so than even my mom, but I think that's the, what society tells us, right. Men aren't supposed to cry. I want Mason to know that he can cry and that he can cry and use his emotions to tell his story, to tell what he's feeling, to express what he's feeling because everybody needs a good cry. I mean, I, I, I find therapy in crying. Like when I get to the other side of those, that big tear fest, I'm like, Ooh, something just like, Ooh, right. It's a release. A little more loose. Like this is, this is good. So it's, it's, it's funny. You do literally just said what you said. I remember I, I had an episode a few months ago um, and I was talking about this and I brought up the fact that it was probably, my son was probably a month old at the time and he's just crying out of nowhere. Like everything's fine. All of a sudden, boom, everything's just crying. What the hell? And I remember telling him, his name is Brooks. I'm like, Brooks, there's no, there's no crying. There's no crying in baseball. Like I'm just making this joke. Yeah. Yeah. And then I caught myself thinking, you know what? There is crying. There is crying in this house. And I'm going to make sure he knows it's okay to cry. If he needs to come to me and cry and like, he doesn't need to put on this stoicism or because he's a, he's a man or he's a boy. Like he needs to know that actually crying is allowed in this house and that's okay. If you need to come to me and cry and talk to me about things, I want him to know the invitation is there. So uh, you just like, like made me tear up. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> oh, that's so I literally true. call myself I saying that. that. Like, I don't, I don't say that yeah. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, it's so funny. Cause I say the same thing. It's just like, there's no crying in baseball. Oh, yeah. And then sometimes I'll joke. I'll be like, Oh, you're being a baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you crying? You're being a baby. And it's just like a joke. <laughs> You know, but but there is a lot of truth in that. And I do think that, you know, um, you know, there 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 is like the fine line too about discipline, right? Like, you yeah. know, he, he's crying and he's upset because I took something away from him. Well, you know what, Mason, like 
that can hurt you. And there's a reason I took that from you. Right. And so it's being more maybe intentional about explaining like I, mommy didn't just take that from me because I'm a mean mommy. Like mommy took that because, you know, you've had your, you've had your fill of junk food today. It's time to, time to simmer down now. Or, you know, that, that, that tool can be very sharp. We don't want that. We don't want right. Mason to get hurt. Um, but this all like, this is such a good conversation too. I could go for hours because it's like a learning experience too. Right. And being, able oh, to yeah. things. cause like you're posing questions and I'm like, Oh, I haven't thought of it, but yeah, that's. Really good, <laughs> I told you, I think know? way, way ahead in time here. So maybe I'll be ready by the time he's like 10 years old. I'm like, I've been waiting for this. Yeah. Um, I think what's, what's interesting is coming to my, top of my mind right now is I know you've heard this saying numerous times. This comes into my mind a lot because I think, I think it applies to life, not just sports. Are you playing hurt? Or are you playing injured? I think there's a, it correlates to a lot of things in life for me personally. I ask myself all the time, like, am I not going to the gym tonight because I'm tired or because I actually like have a real excuse or real reason I'm injured, I'm hurt. Uh, there's other stuff going on in my life. I don't know. I, that, that saying just kind of popped up in, in my life a lot. And I think that's probably going to be something I ask myself. Uh, is my son feeling, is my son just feeling like, is he crying because I took his toy away or is he crying because there's just something deeper there that needs to be talked about and need to be resolved and stuff like that. I don't know. Yeah. I just, like I said, that just randomly popped into my head and that's something I'm thinking about yeah. kind of often, honestly. Yeah. Um, I got to ask you, um, I know a lot of your message is owning your story and you try to help others own their story. Um, we all have a story. And nobody really compares to yours, no should, nor should anybody compare to yours. There is no worse. There is no better. There is none of that. Everyone's. So, I'm so glad you're bringing that up because people love to, oh, well, I want to share my story with you. It's not nearly as bad. And I'm like, right. your lived experiences are your lived experiences. And there is no comparison, right? Uh, better or worse, any of that, right? level playing field here. Yep. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you stated that. Cause I think that's important to remember. Yeah. Yeah. Comparison. You, you can't compare throughout life. I mean, God, that's why social media is just like the, the devil sometimes is because everyone's mm -hmm. comparing and everyone starts feeling bad about themselves. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I feel that the day you opened up those toxicology reports for whatever made you want to do it on that day, 10 years later, there's probably some kind of a trigger that made you want to do that might be the day that you actually started to really own your story. Um, is that true? And for people that are in the shoes that you were in that are struggling to own their story, what was the catalyst that got you there? What would you tell people try this or think about this or whatever? So they can actually take the power back instead of giving the power away. I love that. Uh, wow. I mean, I think that that definitely, um, you know, coming from your vantage point, like you're, you're obviously seeing it. I feel like I'm getting some, some therapeutic diagnosis here. Uh, <laughs> I'm not right? a therapist you're, at you're, all. <laughs> you're good. You're good at this. You're good at this, Ryan. Um, no, but you know, it definitely, it resonates, right? Because here's the thing, you know, yeah. Like seeing that on paper finally to me, um, so it was about the seven year mark is when I started to accept it. And really what that means is, yeah, you know, I used to go fist to cuffs with my auntie Linda. That's my mom's sister. She, her and my uncle Mike took me under their wing. I was 18, didn't know how to survive. I needed all the help I could get. Right. So they took me under their wing, even though I was, uh, you know, of age. Um, so they didn't necessarily adopt me, but very much still needed that guidance. And around the seven year mark is when I finally like quit going fist to cuffs with her and finally allowed her to lovingly share their story openly and say what had actually happened in my presence without me literally wanting to come across the table and bop her in the face. Like I just was so angry and I felt like she was attacking my parents. You're attacking mom and dad. Like you're that, like, I just felt like she was a liar and like I did everything I could. Right. Because I fabricated the story for so many years that I wasn't willing to allow anybody else to change the story. And so around the seven year mark is when I think the acceptance started sinking in. But then it, it was the 10 year mark that I actually opened those talks reports. And I do think that that's really where I found my footing and started to own the story because now here it is in front of me. 
And I mean, it's plain as day. Although, like I mentioned, there's still a lot of black holes, a lot of things that we've now discovered post, you know, all, you know, this time frame. But I do think, and I use this terminology a lot, exonerated, because to me, you hear the word exonerated a lot of times when people are imprisoned, right? And they are exonerated from their sentence. Um, I was a prisoner of myself because I was locked in this whole continuum of like shame and didn't want people to know the truth. And now that I've told this story for so long, how the heck am I going to come out and actually be honest with it? And then you tell this story so much so that you're lying to yourself that now you believe yourself and now it becomes the truth. Like I literally made, I, 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 I spoke this story into existence and then it becomes the truth, right? In my mind, but there is only one truth, right? There's really only one truth. Yet I had created this whole thing, but then I opened those toxicology reports and now I'm seeing it on paper. And that was really the first time because I did that at my local TV station, CBS 42, that I worked for when I moved here in 2011. So when I did this, I guess this was back in 2013. So, oh, by the way, that was the first time that my story like truly went public from my voice, like from my vantage point. And what's crazy about it is not only did it unlock this shame for me, it unlocked so much for other people. And why is because there were so many people that I didn't realize that were attached to my parents, that knew my parents, that loved my parents, that were colleagues of my parents, that always wondered what happened. And I think sometimes we forget how important the truth can be to people, right? I'm thinking like, oh, it's been 10 years, like who really cares? There's a lot of people that knew and loved my parents and truly wanted to know and find peace in knowing what happened that day. And I'd actually gotten some messages resp responding to that video feature that I did, talking openly about their um, addiction and their death. And instead of it being what I thought it would be, which is like, oh, wow, her parents were drug, drug addicts, right? Like this whole stigma thing. It was literally just this embrace, right? This, we loved your parents so much and knowing the struggles that they went through, the fight that they went through and still loved you and your brother, still loved the people around them, still came to work every day, not every day because there were relapses and situations, but came to work and still still lived life to the best of their ability. And they fought and they fought and they fought and they fought. Then suddenly I'm now seeing this perspective that it's not people that are judging. It's people that are loving. We love your parents and we, 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 we have loved them since the day we knew them. And now we love them just the same, if not more knowing what has happened and that we wish maybe we could have stepped in and then it furthers the conversation. I know someone that's struggling with addiction. Mm -hmm. My family's struggling with this addiction. So then it's opened this pathway to giving people permission to share their story, to share what they've gone through. Okay. And so I think about sitting there on that couch, opening those toxicology reports. Because I'll tell you, my aunt got those from the coroner's office 90 days after my parents died. She walked outside, handed me the envelope. I refused to go in there with her. Sitting in the sweltering heat in the air-conditioned car, she handed it to me, said, hey, you want to read this? Nope. Threw it no. on the floorboard. Yep. Never thought about it again. Never All thought. that mattered, they were gone. It's in, whatever you read wasn't going to bring them back. So yeah. I completely understand that and, and learning more about the grieving process is like everybody handles it differently. And that doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means you're handling it the way that you know how to handle it. Um, there's, there's a lot of people that know someone like you, someone going through something tough, um, whether they lost a parent, whether they lost a loved one, where they lost a, a pet. Uh, my pet dog was my best friend. Um, looking back, what were some things that you needed from others? So if there's someone from the outside that knows someone going through this, just going through a ridiculously hard time, all of a sudden tragic and, and thrown into the grieving process, what 
were some of the things that perhaps you needed from others around you to help support you that people, cause you know, when something happens, I think everyone's like afraid. I don't want, I don't want to bother them. I don't want to call them. I just send my thoughts and prayers and stuff like that. Like that doesn't do it. Um, what is, what is something or what are some things you can possibly, you, you probably needed during that time, but perhaps didn't know and can give that advice to someone else. Yeah. I mean, I think the support system was obviously huge. Um, having the people there that I don't even think I realized would be the primary key players and stepping in, right. My aunt and uncle, I mean, I was close to my aunt. She was there. I was born in Cuba. Like my dad was in the military. I mentioned that like she was there from day one. I was very close with my aunt, but like I had never, and I don't think any of us do sit there and map out the what ifs of like, well, if this were to happen, who would take care of me? Like I never thought about that. Right. Because my parents are invincible. Nothing's going to happen to them. Um, I will say that between my aunt and uncle, uh, you know, my cousin, Justin, I mentioned him, that's my, my aunt's son and, and, you know, my brother, my, my cousins, you know, uh, then my gymnastics team, I would say was huge for me. So being an athlete, being at Rutgers, I say this a lot and, you know, um, some people might argue that, you know, life, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll lean into whatever resilience factors you have, but. I had actually wanted to go to the Air Force Academy because I wanted to get my school paid for because I wanted to do med school. And I knew that like financially, like that was the ticket, right? So I was going to go to the Air Force Academy, was being heavily recruited for gymnastics. Oh, by the way, my SAT scores sucked. And I took it three times and they sucked every time. Um, so I didn't get in. Uh, they wanted to send me to prep school for a year to try to get my grades up. And um, that's when I knew like, all right, we got to shift here. Like, that that's let's go in a different direction. And so that's when I was still being recruited and thankfully Rutgers still had a scholarship available. And so I went in that direction, but I think about that. And I think about the blessing that was my Rutgers gymnastics team. Right. So my aunt and uncle really kind of pushed me back to Rutgers and said, Hey, you got to go back to school. You got a commitment. You've got to get back. And then it was kind of like passing the baton in a way, right? Like, Okay, you're going to go do school. You're going to go finish up. I had a roommate there. My roommate, Kara, was on the field hockey team. I think without her and without my friend, friends, Craig and Kate, like all the people that were already like a foundation in my life because it was second semester. So, you know, I felt like I felt I had my footing. I had my friends. I had my people. And I'm so thankful for that because those are the people that filled the gaps. Those are the people that made sure that I didn't give up. Those are the people that gave me tough love and said, look, we understand you're going through this thing. You're flunking out of school. You better, you, you got to figure this out and we got the resources. We're going to help you, but like, we got to do something right. Those are the people, those are the lifeline. And so I would just encourage and give that advice to people. Right. You know, I think a lot of times we want to go into isolation when we have tragedy, when we, when we, when we feel, cause we feel alone in it we feel like, well, there's no way Ryan can understand what I'm going through. No, he cannot understand what I'm going through. Right. You cannot possibly fully comprehend that, but that doesn't make you lesser than that doesn't make you unqualified and unequipped to help someone to be that person for them. So that's leaning in and say, how can I help you? What can I do? Is that just to be here to listen? Is that to maybe bring you a meal? Is that to have a conversation? Is that to be your person that in the middle of the night, if you wake up just completely like disheveled that I, my, I've got my phone on and I will pick up the phone. If you call me that accountability partner, someone you go to the gym with someone that you get a meal with once a week, whatever that is, find those people. Because I will say Rutgers was my lifeline. Those were the people you know, um, aside from my aunt and uncle that really truly stepped in and literally loved me through it, loved me hard, tough love, but gave me that chance to stand on my own two feet again. And I think without that, I literally would have just been a, like my dreams, hopes, goals, aspirations, everything I'd worked hard for. I was always a great, you know, AB honor roll student, always made the grades, always, you know, excelled. I was the perfectionist, you know, a gymnast, right? Like perfect 10. Hello. Um, I think that without, without them, you know, I, I, I don't know where I would be. I don't think I, I don't think I would be sitting here today mm -hmm. having this conversation with you. Cause I don't know that life would have taken me in this direction. Um, and I think that just 
the stepping stones, the pieces of like, you know, them helping me get back on my feet, giving me the resources. I was still able to graduate. I'm now turning direction. I'm now doing this sports broadcasting thing. Um, you know, it's been a tumultuous journey, but it's been one that, you know, has come with so many ups and downs and, um, it brings me full circle to this moment, right? That like, you know, I'm a professional storyteller, but like there was a point in time where I couldn't share my own story. And I think that's what I love so much about this journey is that like, I'm realizing that like the sports broadcasting thing is so much more than myself and being on TV and interviewing these people and, you know, confetti is raining down, right? <laughs> like this is so much fun. But at the end of the day, like, yes, it's a cool job. But what's even cooler is like, I get to be a voice for, people and make an impact, right? Like when I can share someone else's story openly and out loud and someone listens in and hears this story, wow. mm. they went through that. That's pretty amazing. And everyone has one, everyone, no mm -hmm. one's special enough not to have their own story. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I, you're welcome back anytime. I, I, there's so much more to hit on, but I, I, I really want to, we're going to do you, it again. We're yeah, going to get yeah, into this. this. Is, we're this just going to really have a part good. two and a part three. Like that's fine to me. Yeah. A story's uh, many chapters. So come to Raleigh, first of all, for a game, we could do one in person as well. Um, yeah. All right. So this is called the pursuit of happiness. I want to ask you this and I, I should probably ask this in every one of my podcast. Are you happy? And something that I think a lot of us deal with when they go through tragedy or trauma is they don't allow themselves to be happy or they feel guilty for being happy. I shouldn't be smiling now. I shouldn't be laughing now. This terrible thing happened to me. I, I, I can't laugh. This I'm not allowed to have fun. Um, I know that's something I went through myself personally when, when I was grieving and just like, you'd be smiling and laughing, like, hold on a second. I shouldn't be laughing. I should be hurting. And how do you handle the situations where that perhaps arises? Um, I'm thinking milestone days. I'm thinking Christmas. I'm thinking your son's first birthday when your parents were there to say happy birthday. Uh, there's people that are probably just absolutely buried in the sadness of what they don't have and what could have been and what should have been on those moments. Um, that's completely human. Uh, I think all of us think that, how do you turn your mindset into, okay, I feel sad. I'm feeling that sadness, but I'm going to change this into a positive or change your perspective. Like, how do you do that? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's taken time to get to that point. Right. Um, you know, I'll say kind of early on, it was like, I was hanging on to everything I could, like all the traditions, everything that my family, well, Christmas, like my, this is how my mom did it. This is how my dad did it. Right. And I remember my auntie Linda working so hard to make everything just like my mom did it. The big Easter baskets, the big meals on the table and this and that my aunt, she will tell you, she's not a great cook. She doesn't love to cook. So she was having to work overtime to try to like make it work. Right. But you know, I spent so much time trying to chase what was, right? Like time is always moving forward, but it's like, how do you chase the past? And I was chasing everything that once was, and it became so exhausting. Um, and I remember there was a point in time where like, I didn't even want to get married because I was so terrified of the loss. I was terrified that I wouldn't enjoy the moment that I wouldn't enjoy the celebration of marriage because my parents weren't there. Right. And it was taking the joy away from the reason that you're there in the first place, which is to be with my husband. And, and I'm to also sure I'm not to cut you out. I'm sure that you had visions of your dad walking you down the aisle, right? Like, yep. That's every, every, every girl does. Right. Yeah. Like that's, that's the, that's the traditional, Dad's going to walk me down the aisle, you know, Lord willing, if your father is in your life um, or that father figure, whoever that might be to you. And so there was that massive fear. Like, how is it like how am I might even possibly like why even why even get married? Why even go down this road if, you know, if I'm not going to have those things? And I will say, obviously, it took a lot of healing in that in that journey for me to get to the place where, believe it or not, we ended up getting married during COVID 2020. 
um, in the chapel at Church of the Highlands where we go to church. And it was because, I mean, that thing's booked out for months and months on end. Like we never, you know, would have had that. We And we actually were supposed to get married in Virginia at the resort Dirty Dancing was filmed. And that was kind of oh, like nice. the same to fame. And that was home for us. That was home for my husband. That was home for me. So that was the original plan. Then the pandemic happened. So we end up in the you know, the church here in Alabama and it ends up being eight people, right? My, my, my aunt and uncle, my brother and cousin, and then my husband's parents and his brother and sister-in-law. Right. So it's wild because like, we're sitting there empty church and I was again, like, how is this going to go? Right. And I had this charm that I put on my, my, um, it was a, a charm with my parents' picture with lace from my mom's dress that was wrapped around the bouquet. It was gorgeous. And it's wild because I feel like, you know, the florist brought that bouquet to me in that moment. I had my moment of just like, oh my God, it's so beautiful, all the things. And that moment of like, uh, but can I just tell you, and I know like as a woman of faith, the good Lord stood in the gap that day for me, but my husband and I made this choice, right? Because we were like, well, who's going to walk me down the aisle? Is it going to be my uncle and my brother, both of them? Blah, blah, blah. We decided, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to go, I'm going to do it on my own. Because ultimately our pastor also said, like, that's a traditional thing. Like they said, that says your, your dad walks you down the aisle, but that does not have to be that way. That's just mm -hmm. tradition, right? But mm -hmm. that, there's nothing that says you have to do that. Because ultimately your, your father is your Lord and Savior, right? But I remember for so many years being worried about what that moment was going to be like. And I swear, I, I, it was just like those doors flung open. And I look back at those pictures of me just standing like, by myself. Like, here I am. Like mom and dad are not with me, but they're, they're in here. They're in my heart. And really just like, what a beautiful moment. Um, I think for me to almost feel like I'd accomplished something right. That I had accomplished this, this, you know, this work that I had put in to get to a place where I truly felt comfortable in knowing that we can't always look back on the things we don't have that we have to face forward and think about the things we do have. Right. And so that was to me, um, you know, a big step in the right direction and, and understanding and knowing like, Hey, you know, yes, we're all going to experience loss. We're going to experience tragedy. We're going to experience a lot of heartache in our lifetime, but now it's, what do you do with that? Right. Um, it's okay to be sad about it. It's okay to miss them. But if you spend so much time dwelling on the what ifs in the past and well, it's not going to be the same and, and trying to replicate everything that was like time moves forward, right? Regardless. So even if my parents were here and this is hard for me to process Ryan, but it's hard for me to process like what they would look like. You mentioned you still have your parents, your wife still has her parents, you know, but they don't look the same as they did 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. They don't move the same. Um, you know, I think about that all the time. And now even with my aunt and uncle, you know, everyone ages, like I age, like getting out of bed in the morning is a, you know, a struggle at times. Um, you know, but everybody ages and it's hard for me because sometimes I, I get stuck in that continuum of like my parents just like time stopped, like time stopped. But regardless, even if they were the healthiest human beings without their addiction problems, there would still be issues. There would still be things they're battling, you know, <laughs> and there's no way of knowing what that looks like. But I think that we can get so caught in the past and the what ifs and everything else that we forget that time moves forward and we forget to embrace the moment and, and embrace the time that we're in right now. So I think that that's why we have to, you know, um, hold on to those memories because I think they're beautiful and I'm so grateful for them. But I can tell you this, my parents have not been here on this earth for 21 years. They left me at 18 years. I crossed that intersection of being on this earth longer without them than with them when I turned 18 years old, okay? But what I look at now is my love for my parents, like you think, well, they're no longer here with us. My love for them has grown exponentially in the time that they've been gone. And I mean, what a gift. Like, I love my parents so much more. And, and there, yes, there was anger. Yes, there was, I'm pissed that this happened. Why did they do this? Why did they not? Sh there was anger. And there was, there was plenty of reasons for me to be resentful and spiteful about this whole situation. And that's what I want to encourage people to, you know, there are going to be people out there that hurt you. 
addiction, especially, man, I'll tell you, because, you know, lying, cheating, stealing, I mean, all the things that people do, especially when they're under the influence to get that next fix, you know, there's a lot of bad that can come with it. Um, but like, I just want to encourage people to hold a place, no matter how angry or upset they are with someone or something to hold in your, hold a place in your heart for that love to grow. Because I truly believe that my love for my parents is just magnified. And you think like, how in the world do you love someone even more that they're gone? And I think, you know, a lot of it has to do with now using my voice to help others. Um, talking about their story as painful as it, as it is, I also feel like I um, have grown so much and my love for them has just grown in the years that have passed um, since they left us. The wonderful way to wrap this up. I also can't help but feel that, you know, assuming your parents were watching over you, like to see you two decades later, not just sweep it under the rug and say, yeah, my parents are no longer here. But anyways, right. You continue to tell their story. You continue to talk about them. You continue to use them as an example to help other people through their hard times. Like, in a weird way, you're taking a really terrible situation and actually kind of like making the best of it and helping others with it too, which is like, it's incredibly hard as it can be. I'm, I'm sure it is for you. That's just, that's incredible. Um, and I'm sure that they would be proud that you're doing that. So that's, that's amazing. And I, like I said, there, I, I, we can keep going. So come, come back. We'll, that we'll dive even deeper. If, if, and let me know when you go to that therapy session, let me know what your therapist says about it, those it. things. I'm on my list right here. Yes. <laughs> because I'm curious now. I'm not too far yeah. behind you as far as the age goes. Um, yeah. I was going to say big shout out to Neely Haynes. She's uh she's my girl and she, uh she has taught me a lot and actually have written, you know, there's some things in the book that have utilized some of the things that we've discussed and talked about, but it's so good when you have that person that you can just like lean into. And sometimes I'm like, Hey, can we get our computers out or get a notebook out and like workshop some stuff here? Because it's so helpful um, to me to have a better understanding and a clearer picture, because it also gives me that, uh, you know, almost that toolkit, that tool belt to help more people with it. When I have these insights, you know, um, you know, some free therapy sessions, why not? Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And speaking of tool, the tool belt, um, your book is coming out October 1st, 2024. Give us more details. Where can we get it? Give us all the good stuff. I know. I'm so excited. Look, y'all, this has been a process. I was actually going to release this book last year and then I had a baby and I was like, uh, I'm not ready for this. I needed a, <laughs> it's a lot. I was a lot. Um, yeah. So I'm super excited about October 1st. Uh, it is on pre-sale right now on Amazon currently. So if you are interested and anxious to go ahead and get it, you can go on Amazon. The book is called Shatterproof. Um, you'll know it's this when you see this cover on the cover. The subtitle is how I overcame the shame of losing my parents to opioid addiction and found my sideline shimmy. So um, the sideline shimmies, you know, my famous dance move on the sidelines that I've become known for. I love to dance, um, but it's been a source of therapy for me as well. Just uh, getting to move and shake off some of the nervous, anxious energy. Um, but my goal is to help people to find their sideline shimmy. What brings them joy, right? Everyone's, everyone's got a sideline shimmy in them and they may not be dancing, but their version of that. And you know, I just want to help people meet them where they're at. And so, yep, get on Amazon. I'd love to connect with you all. I have a website, laurensisler.com. Shoot me a message there. Um, and I'm on social media as well, at Lauren Sisler. Would love to just connect with you, chat with you, uh, share your story. Let me know what, you, what you've what been up to. Anything that resonates with you from our conversation today with Ryan, uh, would love to hear from you. Amazing. And everything you just listed will be in the show notes. So scroll on down. The link will be there for your book and how to follow you on social and go to your website. Uh, you've been a blast. Um, really, re before I let you go, I really want to know this from your perspective. What is the best atmosphere in college football? Oh, I knew you were going to ask that. Oh, I wish, you know, it's funny. It's sometimes hard to articulate because I will say like, I've been to so many and I'm like, oh, well, this one's the best. And then I go to another, oh, I don't know. This one's the best. It's so hard. I mean, I will say this. I grew up around Virginia Tech and let me tell you, night mm -hmm. game in Lane Stadium, inner Sandman, Metallica, everyone's jumping. Oh gosh. Ugh. Just I've seen the videos. It's like, wow, one of these days I'll get there for that. I know. It's awesome. Like it just gets you, it gets the juices going, man. I'll tell you. Um, but I've been around a lot. I mean, 
There's so many different atmospheres. Death Valley, LSU at nighttime is such a good atmosphere. I say Texas A&M. It's weird because it's like, like even when you walk in an empty stadium, it's this this eerie feeling of like all these like ghost fans. Like just you, you it's like you can hear the, the 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 cheers and like it's 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 this really cool like feeling even when this stadium's empty. Um, but there's just so many good ones and even some of the smaller stadiums. I think that's the thing that gets overlooked. I went to Rutgers like. I think they finally closed in our stadium and it holds like 45,000 now. Right. But I'm used to going to these sec stadiums, a hundred plus right. thousand fans, right. Alabama, Tennessee, uh, Texas A&M. Um, but Rutgers has a pretty good sound. Like it's a bowl. So like, I remember just being in there and finally we started having some success towards the end of my, you know, college career. Uh, you know, just the acoustics in there are, you know, pretty, pretty strong. And, you know, again, I think a lot of it's what you make it and, you know, I think there's nothing better than like when you are in a stadium and you watch, you know, a player kind of like go do his thing. And, um, you know, he comes around and like they're at the bench and they're high fiving and this and that. And like in the background, you can like hear their parent or their loved one or their, you know, whoever the, 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 the family that's there watching, you just hear like them shout out like, Oh, that's my boy. You know, that's like awesome. that's when you're like, dang, like, this is so cool. You know? Um, just pride, you know, it's just that pride, you know, those parents have. And I think it just takes me back to the the pride that my parents took in my gymnastics career and did everything they could to um, support that. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Um, That's got, some, got some other, uh, you know, of course, some stadiums on my bucket list that I haven't hit yet. Um, Michigan, Ohio State, Oregon, like there's some other ones that I've never been to before. But I think slowly but surely I'll make my way there eventually. So. Awesome. Well, hope to see you there on TV and then I'll have to follow up to see how it was for you, but, uh, we'll catch up soon. We will do this again. I promise this is a great time. And, uh, Lauren, it was, it was my pleasure. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for being honest and vulnerable. That's what this is all about. And good luck with the book. Um, please everybody go, go check it out. There's way more than what we talked about on this episode. So Lauren, thank you so much. Appreciate it, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.